hosting um, a conversation with Tony Anthony. I am Phil Pajali, a librarian with the Yonkers Public Library. And um, tonight, uh, moderating with me is my brother, Chris Pajali, who is Hello. from the New Rochelle Public Library. Uh, this is Tony's book, Anthony's Quotes and Thoughts Collection That Might Touch a Nerve. I would like to thank um, Jay Michaels for helping us with this program and supporting it. I would like to thank the New Rochelle Public Library. Okay, Chris is representing them, so they're collaborating with us. I would also like to thank the Friends of Crestwood Library uh, and Panzero Productions. Uh, thanks everyone for coming by uh, tonight for this special event. Uh, this May 6th marks the 40th anniversary of a screening that took place at the United Theater Owners show Arama convention in Kansas City. A screening attended by some 1,000 motion picture exhibitors who were there to see a new 3D movie that was generating a lot of buzz. Now this was 1981. A lot of these theater owners had been around when 3D movies first came and went in the 1950s. And ever since then, every few years, there had been attempts by independent producers to bring back 3D. Uh, but with the exception of a couple of X-rated films like The Stewardesses and Andy Warhol's Frankenstein, it was very much a, a niche market. But this movie, Coming At Ya, was being pushed as the first major 3D feature film produced in 25 years. Uh, there had already been an experiment with 3D movies on broadcast TV a few months earlier, the Rita Hayworth movie, Miss Sadie Thompson, and a Three Stooges short, Spooks, both from 1953, had been shown on television in 3D in several cities to subscribers of select TV. But TV sets in 1981 were not like the TV sets we have in 2021. And Coming At You was coming at us with state-of-the-art 3D effects courtesy of Optimax 3, on big movie theater screens back when watching something on the big screen meant exactly that. Coming At You came out and helped kick off a second 3D movie craze with the release of Friday the 13th and Jaws 3D and Amityville 3D and a bunch of others. But uh, interestingly, it really should have led to renewed interest in the earlier films of its producer and star, Tony Anthony which it did not do. Uh, I was 10 years old when Coming At You came out, uh, too young to see it, but you better believe I read every review I could find of that movie. And uh, those reviews were my first exposure to Tony Anthony, along with the references in those reviews to earlier movies he had made, like Blind Man and the Stranger Trilogy. Well, the video boom hit soon after, but for whatever reason, most of Tony Anthony's movies were not issued on videotape in the U.S. and never played on TV. They were made as hard as heck to find for the rest of the 80s. It wasn't until the mid-90s, I think, that the Stranger movies started showing up on TNT, and uh, you know, so Phil and I could finally see them, and, and we started getting our hands on sloppy-looking bootlegs of Blind Man and Get Mean from pal transfers or splicey 16 millimeter prints that had been camcorded off the of walls and you know someone's den uh it was crazy the the quality of these movies it's only been the last 10 years that we've really been able to watch these movies in a respectful presentation that does them justice and speaking of respectful presentations i've talked long enough uh let's uh let's get on with the show a, a long journey with tony anthony Yes. Well, before we do that, um, I just I just want to mention that uh, Tony, who we're very lucky to have with us tonight during this event, is on the line. So, uh, Tony, do you want to just say hello? Hello, everybody. <laughs> My compliments to all you artistic people that helped to make this long journey possible in this format, and everybody that's tied in tonight. Thank you for coming. And all I can say is I hope you have a good ride. And I'll talk to you later. And, and Tony, thank you for being with us tonight and for making this program possible. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm.
most people have talent for one thing or the other. And if they are fortunate enough to find it and their profession and work hard and never give up, that's the key, especially artists. They all face many bumps and they got to learn. They must not be bitter. They just got to get better because they're going to fail a lot before they succeed. And that's the story of my journey, a long journey. And buddy, it wasn't easy and it's not easy for anyone. My father's mother and father came from Italy. My mother's father and mother came from Hungary. The Hungarians came in this area to work in the factories. My father's family, they struggled in the construction in the coal mines, strip mining, where they take the tops of the mountains off and dig down to find the veins of coal. And that's a rough life, buddy. And they work like hell. And when I was a kid, my dad push me. He says, you want money to spend on the weekends and stuff? You know, when I got to high school, then you're going to work. So they put me in the strip mine with my cousin, Gene, who became my best friend in life. And uh, we were working shoveling coal. And buddy, I hated it. And that's the time that I was in high school when I became interested in being in the plays. And, and I just began to fall into that world. People made fun of me. You couldn't say back in those days to anybody that you wanted to be an actor or you wanted to be in the theater. Or you, they just humiliated you. So I was just isolated to my dreams. My father had a, a brother. His name was Pete Petito, and he was an amazing guy, and, and he found the way to go to college, and it was the war years, and if you can believe, the USO was interviewing students around the country to take into the Army to work in the USO, which was entertainment. He was chosen from Fairmont State University, and he was taken into the Army and shipped to Hollywood. And he built all these relationships with them. superstars, Frank Sinatra, Bing Crosby, Bob Hope, Humphrey Bogart. And I kept hearing about him, Pete. But when I was like a senior, he came to Clarksburg that summer to visit the family. And he liked me. And he said to me, are you going to go to college? Because I told him how I hated the mining business and didn't want anything to do with it. And my dad agreed with me. He didn't want me to suffer like he suffered. He said, well, look, you know what you want to do. And I was really embarrassed. I didn't tell him at that time because I'd already made up my mind. I wanted to be an actor. I wanted to go to school to learn, you know? And I said, no, I just haven't decided yet. And he said, well, let me give you some advice. Sometimes it's good to stay out a year till you make up your mind. Because once you make up your mind what you want, and then you go to school, you will be successful because you know what you want and you'll be on the right track to get what you want. He said, I'm in the middle of building a, a, an exclusive trailer park in Palm Springs, California, which was the playground of the stars in those days. He said, when you get out of high school, come spend a year with me. And then I was off. So I arrive at Palm Springs in the middle of the night, jackrabbits jumping all over everything in the desert. Pete picks me up, drives me out to this dude ranch, you know, where they had horses and parties and covered wagons. And we started and extended all his relationships with all these stars. Well, the first thing I learned, he's got 150 acres in construction and all the money that was funding this came from stars, Bing Crosby, Bob Hope, and all the streets were, were marked to be named after the stars. So he gave me a job mixing cement for the building of the wall around this gigantic place. And so being with him, he was a fantastic cook and very social and was always invited to parties and go to this house. People would come by. I got exposed to the sweet life of these superstars mixing cement 
I began to meet these guys, some women too, who worked in the office, and they worked in a, in a, a playhouse there, Palm Springs Playhouse, and they would do like summer theater. And that way they got to meet these people that sponsored this, which because all these stars sponsored the same theater. So I start getting these little bitty parts in all these plays. And that's when I told Pete that I wanted to be an actor. He says, Tony, you're crazy. This business is tough. These people are tough and they're animals. Forget about wanting to be an actor. And here was the big thing. Pete had to go to Hollywood to Paramount Pictures, where they would have a board of directors meeting about how the construction of this huge exclusive trailer park was going. So when I would ride with him to Hollywood, and while he was in the meeting, I'd walk around the back lot of Paramount. And I said to myself, God, if I can get a job as a messenger here, that maybe could help me get started in this kind of world. Mm -hmm. So when I got back to Palm Springs, I had the guts finally to tell Pete, can you get me a job as a messenger at Paramount Pictures? He went completely nuts on me. I wouldn't, if I could even help you, I wouldn't do it. I would, I would be embarrassed to ask somebody for you to be a messenger. And that's your ambition. You're 18 years old. That's your ambition in life. So I knew at that point, I better decide what I'm going to do because that year was getting to the end. I checked out USC. I checked out UCLA, and I knew at that time, from that living out there, all the best talent and who became successful came from New York. See, because that, that's the days of live television, Broadway naturally, off-Broadway, Brando, Dean. Well, now it was training and new style of acting, and New York was the place. And I wrote to Carnegie. Then I got invitation to come to Carnegie for an interview. And I went there and they asked me a thousand questions. And, and I thought to myself, there's no way that I'm going to get past this interview. And I figured because you had to pass that to get an audition. I go back to Clarksburg, go back to work on a strip mine, you know, to get money. I get called. I've been accepted to audition at Carnegie. That means I have to get up on a stage and do a two or three minute monologue. I thought to myself, well, that's the end of that. And my mother says, Tony, this is great. I'm going to find you somebody that can coach you, get you ready. And so help me, she did. She found this little old lady that was a theater major. She used to teach at, at the university here. She trained me. I get there, you go into a little theater that holds 50, 60, 70 people, and all these kids, they're all semi-professional. And you sit there and watch them one by one go up on the stage. I thought to myself, that's it, you'll never make it. By the time they call my name, I did something that I learned from my mother. I closed it off in my, my head. By the time I got to the stage and you're on the stage with one spotlight on you and you can't see anybody, I blocked out the whole world. And I just tore into this scene. At the end, they said, thank you, Mr. Petito. We'll be back to you. Same stuff. Mm -hmm. I left. I said, well, that was a disaster. But I had bl blocked out in my mind where I was and I went into this, this free fall. 30 days later, I was accepted to Carnegie. I had an incredible professor, his name was Alan Fletcher, and he was a Stanislavski teacher. I was having trouble. When they start trying to teach you how to use your interior emotions to interpret the part and then freely perform it and to open up your emotions and use your emotions as your motor. And I was, I was like a fish out of water especially everybody else was, they were rocking and rolling at that time. I was giving up. We had to do improvisations in these classes. So I go into that big class with actors and directors. I get up and I act like I'm in a payphone. And again, I clicked into that 
that void shut out the world. And I dialed and called my dad and mother. And I had this conversation with them about how I couldn't make it here, mentioning actors, other students that I couldn't relate to, names. The, the professor who's sitting there can't understand him. And I, I started to choke up. The whole classroom began to clap. And Alan Fletcher stepped up next to me and he says, Tony, congratulations. You broke through the back wall. He said, you did everything that we've been trying to convince you and teach you to do since the day you walked into this place. And it was fantastic. And you exposed yourself. The light came on. I knew what the hell I was doing. I knew what they were talking about. And that's how my career began. And I did two years. And that's when I made the decision because now I understand why did they put me in a competitive situation. That's what's so fantastic about that Carnegie. They prepared me for the street, the wars that you must go through in the entertainment business. I was ready for New York, so I quit. So I called the old man. He got so mad at me and screamed at me and hung up on me. I couldn't go home, so if I went to New York, I better make it. The Brill Building was a huge office building where all the music people were, the record labels, studios. So I used to hang there and I met all these musicians. I start writing songs, but just by memory, because I, I can't read music to this day, but I was writing rock and roll. And so I met a guy and he worked in music and I told him I'm a songwriter. He said, well, I'd like to hear some of your songs. I did the songs for him. And he said, well, you got to get the money and hire a guitarist and go in a little room. will cost you a hundred bucks and get a disc because I think I can sell your songs. So he helped me find a guitarist, and we went in this little room, and I labored through four or five songs. One of them was called Peekaboo. So he gets a, a meeting with this little rock and roll label. So I go in and I meet the, his head of production and the owner. He puts up the disc, and he asks me to perform. Well, I was good at moving and imitating, uh, you know, Frankie Avalon and all these people that you saw every day or you saw them in the rock and roll shows and things. And I, so I used my acting ability, pranced around his office and sang the songs. The owner gets up, you ever performed in front of people? I said, yeah, a lot, but as an actor, not as a singer. I said, I'm not a good singer. I got a knack for writing songs. This guy says, well, look, I'd like to take a chance on you. He said, I'd like to record you. I said, you want to record me? Why? I can't sing. He said, rock and roll people, most of them can't sing anyway, but I like, I like your presentation. I got to get you in front of a thousand kids because you'll do okay. I almost passed out. I sat down on the radiator and burned my butt. And I thought, there's my pathway to being an actor. It's the first thing that hit me. If I can do this, that'll help me get jobs as an actor. I signed the contract. He said, now, before we do this, is a problem. I said, what's that? You got to change your name to ethnic. Frankie Avalon is not ethnic. Elvis Presley is not ethnic. You're too ethnic. You're going to have to change your name. I said, Tony Anthony. He said, Tony, Tony, what kind of name is that? He loved it. So I became Tony Anthony. First of all, they had to buy me a sport jacket, ties, pants, shoes, because I was like poverty in that time. I was so bad in that recording. All black artists, fantastic musicians. I was so bad in that they would have to touch my shoulder for me to hit my cues. Believe it or not, down in the South, this little stupid record, Peekaboo ICU, begins to move and get this jockey play. Now they getting excited. They want me to go on a disc jockey tour outside of New York. I said, well, what do you mean disc jockey tour? He said, you go, we'll get you in big high schools where disc jockeys go for weekends, play all the hits, the kids dance, and artists appear, 
and mouth their records and dance and, and perform as they mouth the records. I called my cousin Gene. I said, you're not going to believe this. They want to put me on a disc jockey tour and I want you to come here and go with me. So Gene comes to New York and they send us out to New Jersey in a limo. Can you believe it? We go in and I stopped in my tracks. There's 500 kids in front of this stage. One of the, the radio disc jockeys there and he sat up with all kinds of speakers and everything. He introduces me to the kids. So when they introduce me, then they say, let's hear the song, Tony. This is peekaboo, you know, that kind of embarrassing stuff. And they put that through those speakers and I'm not singing. I'm just acting and mouthing. So I start my strutting and moving and pointing and looking and all the good looking girls start edging their way up closer to me. And by the time I get done, they're reaching up, trying to grab my clothes. Now the record company's really excited because the kids like me. Copacabana, number one nightclub in New York. Biggest stars in the world. And once a week, the best disc jockeys from New York City would do an interview show from this little stage. They want to interview me. So we go to the Copa that night and he interviews me. Congratulations, your record's starting to move in the South. It's coming to New York soon. All the people staring at me, he's silence, you know. He said, well, now everybody's anxious. Let's hear the song. After about 30, 40 seconds, everybody starts looking at each other and starts speaking, turning on their backs to me. And I knew New York disaster. I knew this is not for me. I said, that's it. I'm an actor. Saul Swimmer, a director, writer, brilliant guy. He was a graduate student. He put me in plays and we became close friends. And he was in New York. We were talking about producing to an off-Broadway show. And I went with Saul and another guy, his name was Peter Gale from Florida. We met this director producer who had a musical called The Follies of 1910. But for us to get involved, we had to raise money. Saul had a wealthy family and Peter had a wealthy family and I couldn't call my family because they, first of all, weren't wealthy. So for me to be a partner, I had to get out there and raise money. I would get meetings with truck companies and, you know, as you start networking, you, you find the way. Finally, after a long voyage, I raised my part to become a partner. So we opened the show at the Carnegie Playhouse in New York. We had a decent run. And that's when Saul and I agreed, why don't we get into the movie business? Let's do a short. We didn't know the first thing about a movie, but we were smart. We found out that Tallulah Bankhead, who was a gigantic star of Broadway, she had a nephew who was like six, seven years old that they said is very talented and that she is sponsored. And we figured if we write the script for, the, for her nephew, we might be able to get her to narrate it. So we wrote the script, the boy who owned a melephant, because this kid with no teeth couldn't say elephant. He said melephant, the name. Tallulah Bank had heard about this, and we said to, that we wanted her to just narrate. So she wanted to meet us. And you talk about a personality. Sit down over here. Now, what's your name? You know, how long have you done this? How, I mean, really tough lady. Are you going to ruin my nephew? Then she really went after Saul because he's the director. And he charmed the hell out of her. She agrees. Well, the minute we got to Lula Bankhead, we knew we could raise the money. So and Peter went to Florida because he was from Miami and he arranged all the things in, in Miami. So we go down there, shoot the film in a few days, come back to New York, took us 30 days or 40 days to get her to get out of her house to come and record. Well, we finally got her in the studio and for sure enough, she was half drunk when she got there. The minute they said action, she was not drunk. One take, didn't even want to hear it. She knew what she did out the door. Well, we got the damn thing done. Now we got to sell it, a short. So we showed it to Universal. And at those days, they always ran shorts 
They're very selective with certain films, and they liked this film. And they had their blockbuster of the year that year, Pillow Talk. And they decided the Melephant was the right short. So the Melephant played every big theater in the United States, and that was the number one film of the year for Universal. We played in hundreds of theaters all over the world. They dubbed it in every language. And there is Saul, Peter, and I sitting with the largest grossing short in, in history at that time. Force of impulse. Saul's going to direct. I'm going to be the one of the stars. Going to shoot it in Florida. And when we get, we go and we we meet a PR guy who introduces me to Alan Klein. Alan Klein was a New York accountant born in New Jersey who was just beginning, and he had built, he began his career finding money for Mike Todd by auditing studios, record companies for around the world in 80 days. Well, we became great friends and he became interested in the movie industry. We made a deal with United Artists to make Force of Impulse. Did poorly at the box office. I got a lot of publicity, didn't do anything. The short got shown at the Cannes Film Festival. So without knowing it, I had begun to make some kind of impression in the, in the international markets. We wanted to make an art film for the art circuit. So we wrote the script, which is a story about a circus performer. When we finished the film, Alan Klein said to me, he liked it. He said, this is a special film. It needs something to take it above what it is. He says, you got to get some big musician to do the soundtrack because that'll help elevate it up for the U.S. So Alan Klein calls up Dmitry Tionkin, the Academy Award winning composer. We go and we see him. He looks at the film, asks us some ridiculous amount of money, 75000 or something, which we didn't have. But God, we got Dmitry Tionkin. If we do what he says to do, which means he would come in and fix the editing and anything else that he felt we should do to present it to the Hollywood community. Well, that was a real voyage because we had to find 75,000. Klein helped us on that. We got it finished and Tiomkin decides he wants to give a screening in Hollywood for us and invite all the celebrities there. Directors, producers, wow, we think we're gonna really break through Hollywood. That's another $50,000. We've got to rent the Director's Guild, give cocktail party. Tiomkin sends, sends invitations, engraved invitations to everybody. And we go there that night, jammed, places jammed. This film starts 30 minutes in the film. I knew we were in trouble because everybody's moving around. You know, those Hollywood screenings can be brutal. And basically, we failed. The film didn't deliver. So we got out of town, you know, got out of Hollywood. Let's go back to New York because we ended up with not getting distribution. So Klein says, I'm taking this film to Cannes. I said, well, I'm not going. I can't, I can't face that kind of humiliation again after that Hollywood thing. So he takes the film to Cannes. And he was right. We got a terrific reaction over there. We never played in the United States with that little film. But I didn't realize at that time how this, the Melephant and this film was making inroads for me as a professional. Another major thing happened. I found this book called The Wounds of Hunger. It was a bestseller written by a Spanish writer named Luis Bota. And nothing ever happened as far as the movie industry because Hollywood didn't like bullfighting movies. And this was a story about two young guys and what they go through to become bullfighters. So it was a great part for me, great part for another guy that helped raise money for us. His name was Brud Talbot. We tried to sell it. Nobody would buy it because bullfighting, limited distribution, which is something that's haunted me my whole career. So we knew if we wanted to make it, we had to raise the money. So we started raising raising money. And we went to Mexico. I think we raised like 600,000. We needed more money, but we figured we'd keep 
if we could get started shooting, we would be able to raise the difference. Well, sure enough, we get to Mexico. Boom, we start to shoot. Boom, we run out of money. What do we do? Shut it down. Now, we got to get out of Mexico, and we owe all this money. It's decided Klein, Swimmer, and this guy Talbot would go to speak to all these people to try to find the difference of the money. And I would stay in Mexico and t- try to hold together everything until they found out if we could raise the money or just chalk it. Well, they couldn't raise the money. So there I am broke. Nobody could bail me out. So I called my dad. I said, you got to get me enough money so I can get out of Mexico because I'm afraid they're going to keep me here forever. I'll never be able to pay all these debts. So the old man sent me a wire and I hired a car and drove across Mexico, got into America through Tijuana, had my girlfriend meet me. So that was the end of Wounds of Hunger. But we didn't stop. We kept chasing it. Brad Talbot and I kept trying to put together a deal. Well, we finally met some European producers that did co-productions. This guy loved, loved the, the material, but he was well-connected with Spain, with different companies where he did co-productions for Westerns and action films, things like that. He said, I, I can get us co-production. If we combine that with a co-production with Italy, you'll get your picture made. So I go with him to Spain. I get the Spanish co-production, that's my first experience of making deals in, in Europe. And these people know who I am from Force of Impulse, what, you know, from the con exposure. And that led to getting a co-production with Italy. Now I'm really cooking because I'm discovering this world of international and how to get past this penny ante raising money to make movies. You can just make co-productions. And then America is all gravy. So that's how I got to Europe. Now, I get to Europe and I discover something. All of Hollywood's in Europe. They're working in Italy. They're working in Spain. They're working in Yugoslavia, working in England, France. You go to a restaurant, you see Elizabeth Taylor, Sophia Lauren. Everybody's in, in Europe. I said, well, I'm in the right place. So I make the picture. We made a deal with MGM. A film came out in Europe, never came out in America like everybody said it wouldn't because people in America didn't like bullfighting. And I started acting in quality Italian films. And that led to me meeting some rich guys that were staying in what they called the American Palace in Rome who were re- very impressed that I was in the movie business and I showed them the film and things. And they said, why don't we start a movie company with you? Can you put that together? I said, absolutely. So I put together a production company there. And pretty soon we were partially funding Italian films, most of which I was in. That all led up to maybe one of the biggest phenomenons in Italian cinema. Sergio Leone made his full of dollars. Clint Eastwood. And the film opened in Italy. It was the most ex- biggest explosion cinema-wise in the history of Italian movies. Bigger than Fellini. I went to see it. Had to stand in line. I went in there and I never could, I couldn't believe the audience reaction. Clapping and cheering. And the same thing happened all over all the international countries. And they went on and made for a few dollars more. And United Artists funded with the Italians and French and all these other people, the good, bad, and the ugly. Gigantic success. Right in this period, every big director in in, in Italy and producer wants to make Westerns, Italian Westerns, spaghetti Westerns. That's all you heard about. Like when they used to make the Hercules movies, they made three, 400 of those there were producers that wanted to make put me in a Western. I'm a street guy. I'm not a cowboy. About this time, Dimitri Tiomkin contacts me. He says, I'm producing, a, 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 I own the book, and I'm producing a big film. It's called McKenna's Gold. I got a great part for you. He convinced me, come with me to Hollywood. We're finishing the script. And I told him, I said, well, you know, they've been talking to me about doing a Western in Italy, but I... 
I don't have any confidence in trying to do a Western. So I'm going to Hollywood. And that was a perfect way to go to Hollywood. Not an agent sending me around, you know, coming there to be in a big film. And Tiomkin calls me to come over to his house. And he says, look, the cast has grown. Omar Sharif, I mean, all, every, everybody was in that. Edward G. Robinson. And they decided to cut this part down. He said, well, it's no longer a co-starring role. So I go back to the hotel where I'm staying, pour myself a big vodka, go out by the pool and I read this script. It's four scenes, no significance. I go back to Tionkin and I said, look, I can't do this. I've been working all these years to, to end up in a bit part and you'll probably end up cutting it. He said, well, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going back to Italy. I got people want to make a Western with me. So maybe I'll just go make a Western. And I left, went back to Italy. The guy that wanted to produce this with me was a guy that I hired on one of the pictures that I made in Italy that I hired as the production manager. So I said, I can raise a couple hundred thousand dollars. So we agree. And one thing he wanted, he has a good friend, he has a quality director. His name is Gigi Luigi Vanzi. I said, let's go. So we hired a writer and we all collaborated on this script. So now it's the day to meet Gigi Vanzi. So we go to a restaurant and we're sitting there and he's staring at me. Made me uncomfortable. Just stared at you, smoking those cigarettes. No, he got up and walked around me, walked around the table, just staring at me, looking him out behind my head and my ears. I said, what the hell is this guy doing? He comes back and he sits down next to me and he points at me. He says, you know, you're not a cowboy. You're a street guy, he says. You're not John Wayne sitting tall in a saddle. You're not Clint Eastwood with blonde hair and blue eyes sitting tall in the saddle. You're like the guy in the street. You're like the guy that can watch you up there on the screen and say, well, I can do that. He said, and if you listen to me, I'll make it happen for you. And then so I walk him out to his car. He says, how are you with a horse? I said, oh, I'm good with a horse. Hell, I hadn't been on a horse since I was a teenager. I said, but I haven't been on a horse for a while, but I'll go into training. He says, well, I hate horses. I said, what do you mean you hate horses? He said, they'll hurt you if you don't know what the hell you're doing. He said, I'll see you next week. Gets in his car and I, I watch him drive off and I thought to myself, what the hell am I getting into? This guy who's an artist, intellectual, hates horses. And he wants to make a Western. As the script's getting finished, he's putting his input in the script, cutting all the dialogue out, putting all this, this direction in and sh shots photographically, you know. He said, I want you to do something. I want you to streak your hair. I want your streak to be blonde or white in between your dark hair, because I had always really black hair. I said, what do you want that for? He says, I'm, I have a concept about what you're going to look like. Just follow me. The Via Condotis, this exclusive street in Rome, where all the big stars and rich people go to and I have to walk in there and they get me and all the women are looking, what the hell is he in here for? And they put me in a chair and they put a cap over my head and pull my hair through all these holes. I said, if I don't end up being bald from this, and they put my head under that dye and bleach my hair white, everybody's looking and kidding and smiling at me and everything, and I'm embarrassed and thinking about, I'm, I better get on a plane, get the hell out of here, that kind of stuff. All at once, when I'm on the street and down restaurants and things, people... This hair is attracting everybody. Then I start getting used to it. Well, the next step was going to dress this guy. We're going to the Kinishita, to the wardrobe division. Now, I had this vision about how I would look as a, as a cowboy, you know, cool this, and cool that, and great looking hat, great looking guns. And, and at the same time, don't forget, I'm training and I'm taking the toughest horses that I can do anything with. Well, we walk in there and there's this stack 
of clothes, old things with holes in them, all these hats stacked there, one on top of the other. He said, Tony, put this on. So I take off my shirt. It's the middle of the summer. And I pull this thing on and that's itching and my elbows sticking out. And I'm thinking to myself, what the hell is this guy doing? Next thing he says, he says, I want to see the Serapis. Again, the most worn out, ugly looking Serapi, the hat. I don't know who used that hat. It had a hole through it here. It had a bullet hole through the brim. It had mud on it, grease stains around it. He said, this will work. He puts it on my head and he moves it around. He tells that woman, he says, put this in a box. Don't touch it, just as it is. All right, the next thing is the horse. So the, the next day we go to get to go to the ranch where I'm training. And I'm thinking I'm going to change his mind about a lot of things when he sees me on this horse. So the stunt man goes back there with me and he loved that horse. He was beautiful, Arabian horse. And I had a train to do certain things there. And I was got good with the horse. So I ride it out. And I back him up, wear him up, spin him around, gallop here. You know, I did the show for him. He said, well, I'm happy to, I, I'm happy to learn that you know how to ride. He said, but that horse is not going to work for us. I said, what do you mean? He said, he's too beautiful. You need a war horse, a horse that's been through what you've been through. Well, I was really upset because I had worked with that, that. That horse took a while for him to get used to me. He wanted a spirited horse, but he wanted a mean horse. That's why I was happy I could ride. And a mean horse will fight with other horses. They bite each other. So that means they're scarred or they bang into things, you know, because they're, they're uncontrollable. That's what JG picked. This horse... He looked good, but he didn't look good. You know what I mean? It looked like he'd been through it. Scars around his forehead, on his neck. That's the horse. Now get on him. And boy, I'm mad. I'm ready to walk off the picture. Because this, I said, this guy will ruin me. I'll never get a job in the movies again. Everybody was mad at me. Now the Italians are putting up money. I still haven't come up with what I said I would come up with. So I'm a little bit of trouble with that. So I decided to go on with it. And that was the birth of Stranger in Town. And that's how Tony Anthony became a cowboy. Now there's a scene in Stranger in Town, if you ever see it, in the middle of maybe 50 lines of dialogue in the whole film. They beat the hell out of me. They smash my face in. They kick my ribs in. And they're leaving me in a dungeon. So I'm trying to escape. Now, here's a guy. I'm crawling across this wet dungeon. So I start action. I start. Stancy screams, Firma, Tony, you have to go get your hat. <laughs> I said, Gigi, if I go for to get my hat, in any theater in this world, they're going to laugh. That's stupid. Tony, you must get your hat. We got into the worst screaming until finally he says to me, a cowboy has to have his gun, his horse, and most important, his hat. Well, the producer my, that I'm producing with comes to me and says, Tony, if you don't do something, we're in big trouble here. He'll walk off this picture. He's crazy. So I did the shot. I go there, half dead, get my hat, put the hat on, and go out all in one shot. And when I saw that picture in New York on Times Square in front of 750 people, they went nuts when I went after my hat. They clapped and cheered because I went for my hat. I'm stuck in Rome now, the film's done. The Italians put up all the money, we're $200,000 short, but I'm sitting with the American rights, if I come up with the 200,000. Well, I can't leave Italy. <clears throat> I got nobody that I can call to get 200,000. We start to get some interest in Europe, the, the rumor about the film, people were talking in a positive way about it. I thought it was the worst crap I ever made in my life. In fact, I was embarrassed to even go there when they showed the picture. I only had one person I could call, Alan Klein. I called Alan. Spaghetti Western, yeah. You got interest over there? Yeah. 
but I need $200,000 and we own America. The European money owes, uh, owns the all international, I got the U.S. and Canada. He said, that's a great deal. And I told him, I said, and United Artists is finally going to unleash Eastwood in America and put out all three films, Fistful of Dollars for a few dollars more and Good, Bad, and the Ugly, one after the other. He says, I know. He said, because I'm involved with MGM. I'll call you tomorrow. He calls me. He says, I spoke to MGM. They're interested. And at that time, Alan Klein had all the biggest stars out of the UK, except the Beatles. I'm going to be on a trip with my attorney and a few other people. We'll stop in Rome just long enough to see the film and then go on to, to London. Well, I figured here's the disaster. Maybe I'm going to end up in jail this time because I owe $200,000 and these Italians will massacre me. Alan comes with all his people. I'm back there smoking cigarettes, nervous as hell. Film starts. The minute I arrive in this town and kill the first guy, they roar in laughter. And I thought to myself, that's it. We're, I'm done for sure. And I leave. He had seven, eight people with him, and they were laughing and clapping all through the film. He said, Klein wants to talk to you. So I come in, congratulations. And everybody's patting me on the back. I can't believe you did this picture. You're a new kind of cowboy star. This, I mean, they were just praising me. I was dumbfounded. So Klein says, oh, you got the deal. You got the 200000 and I introduced him to M. Fischelli, you know, the, my partner. He says, I'll, I'll have two tickets for you guys. Get on a plane. I'll meet you in London. We'll sign all the papers. You'll get your money. And they get in the limo and leave. We go to London. So the, the driver says, Mr. Klein would like to see you for dinner tonight. So I go. We go to the best restaurant in London. He says, how long will it take you to make the second stranger? I said, what do you mean? He said, a sequel. He said, just like this film, more quality, and you got to dress better and get a goddamn horse that looks good. And I said, well, I didn't have to worry about the money. Probably I could turn something out in three, four months after I got the script done. How soon can you start? I can start the minute I get back to Rome. He said, that's good. I want another stranger movie. All up at the 250000 same deal. But you got to promise me you you will be able to see that 50000 on the screen. I said, well, what made you do this? He says, I'm playing a hunch. I got MGM interested and I'm one of the largest stockholders. They said that we're going to follow with this picture, Eastwood opening with the dollar movies. That's why they wanted the second movie. Well, I was in complete shock. Two days before, I thought my career was over where I'd end up in jail in, in, uh, in Italy. By the time I get to New York with the second film, Klein's building in this new uh, office building, the whole top floor for his offices. So we're all living in the Warwick Hotel. And uh, he says, I'm going to show you something. We get in his limo and we drive down Times Square to the Palace Theater one of the biggest theaters on Times Square. Whole front of that theater, the signboard is a stranger with shooting his shotgun with his serapi blowing in the wind. The client says, now you know why I want to do it? That little picture opened to $83,000 in Chicago, duplicated in Detroit and paid for itself in two, three engagements. That's how big it was. I had a picture to do with Vance, so another idea about this Navy guy stranded on an island during the war with all these orphans. We're going all over Jamaica looking for locations and in the middle of the island and when the night they, the guy comes and says, where have you been? Alan Klein's trying to find you desperately. I said, well, I've been out on location, honey. You got to call New York immediately. I called New York. Klein gets on. He says, Tony, forget about what you're doing. Get on a plane. Get back here. MGM wants another stranger movie. I said, you're kidding. They opened the other picture right on the back of the first picture, and it's out doing the first picture. They want the third picture. 
get an ID. He says, you got an idea for the third picture? <laughs> I said, yeah, I've got some ideas. He said, you get on a plane, I'll send a helicopter, get to the main airport, which was uh, Kingston it was, I think. And I'm in the middle of the place. So they sent a helicopter to get me to New York. Well, I arrive, go up to the Warwick again. He comes immediately, he says, wash your face and comb your hair. We're going up to see Bob O'Brien. Bob O'Brien ran the MGM studios. They take me into this huge office and there's Bob O'Brien behind this big desk. He says to me, congratulations, Tony. We got two winners. And I understand you got an idea for a third stranger. And I said, well, it's about a strange, the stranger. Now he's had his problems in the old West. He takes on this job to go to Japan to get his money by doing whatever. Bob O'Brien says, fantastic. Bob O'Brien picks up his phone, calls Red Silverstein. Red Silverstein was the head of all international. This goes to show you how Hollywood can be when you're on a roll. Silverstein comes in, Mr. O'Brien says, now Tony, tell him exactly what you just told me. Stranger fighting the Samurais. <laughs> so I do my pitch again. Silverstein says, incredible, incredible. Japan, what a market. Cowboy against the Samurai with the stranger's concept. And that's how that deal was made. Almost $2 million budget by the time I got ready. Brian Epstein died, who was the manager of the Beatles. And Klein, after being at, on the top for so many years, and he said to me, he says, you know, there's nobody left, which means he had no challenge left. And Klein says to me, I'm going after the Beatles. So we go to, I, I go with him to London right after I got back from Japan. And he became the manager of the Beatles. Okay, Ringo wanted to do a part, but he wasn't just a sweet, nice guy. Alan said to me, he says, can you write something for Ringo, but it's gotta be a co-starring role. I said, yeah, I got a great idea. So Alan calls Ringo because that's, now he's working with Ringo. Ringo loved the, the, he loved the idea, loved the, the what, the director was saying, that's Baldy Ferdinando, who I did many pictures with. And that's how Ringo got in uh, Blind Man. He was not a producer. But see, the, the director really convinced him because he explained how he's going to introduce him. And Ringo's introduction is fantastic in that film. He rides this big horse in and gets off the horse and goes over to a barrel and dips his head in and looks up at the camera. Terrific introduction. And naturally, the the blind man shoots him at the end. My journey with 3D is, is another story. My foreign sales guy, Arthur Herskovitz, he picked up from Taiwan a 3D picture called Dynasty. He said, did you, did you like 3, 3D when it was? I said, yeah, when I was a kid, I used, I love 3D. He said, well, come with me. You're going to see effects like you never saw in your life. So he shows me this dynasty where he put up this silver screen in a screening room in New York. And I couldn't believe it because there was some extraordinary effects in that picture. Not long after that, Herskovitz calls me, says, I got to see you right, right away. So I go over to his office. He says, Frank Wong, the producer of Dynasty, wants to put The Stranger together with Bobby Wing, which they hoped is going to be the new Bruce Lee. He says, no, he, he, he'll pay for a first class ticket for you to come to see him in Taiwan. Maybe because I didn't want to make that horrendous long journey alone. I said, well, tell him I'll come if he'll give me a ticket for my director, Ferdinando Baldi. And so he sends two first class tickets. We get on a plane, we fly to Tokyo, with make that change and, and long trip to Taiwan. And the next day we, we go, he takes, takes us to this dilapidated screening room. We sit down and he puts up these reels, which are just effects. And pretty soon, Baldy and I are laughing and carrying on there, blown away by what we're seeing. I congratulated him. I said, I can't believe that you've done it. This is with the, all with Mike Finley's uh, filming camera. So that night I said to Baldy, I said, Ferdinando, 
just watching that film, I got a hell of an idea. We got to make a spaghetti Western with this kind of thing. We'll blow them away. So I turned down the film in Taiwan. We got on a plane and the first thing when I hit New York, I was tracking down Mike Finley's cameras. Well, he died. And he had trained a guy named Bill Bukowski, who he would take with him when he was shooting, who was a good technician. We looked at the camera, and the first thing we discovered, the camera's upside down. They had a, an eyepiece for the operator, which is all upside down, so the operator could look straight into the camera without turning it upside down. And we decided that we can make improvements, and especially we wanted the 18 wide angle lens. And we knew that if we could bring effects off the screen with the wide angle lens and we could follow focus, it would be a new 3D experience. Klein says he couldn't get involved because there's no theater, so you won't be able to get distribution. But I wouldn't let go. And I figured, well, if I can get started, I got enough money of my own to get me to a point where I can sell the damn picture. So I go and I hire people from Italy and I go to Spain and start building sets, bring all the technicians from Italy and we start. The first thing we discover is shoot a film modern today, not like the 50s. The image becomes distorted when you move the camera and the eyepiece is not accurate because it distorts for the operator who's following focus every minute cost a fortune. And we had to keep testing, testing. I had all these people in the hotel and I thought to myself, here I go again. I had to shut it down, sent everybody home. Took me six, seven months to settle everybody out that I could. And that was it. I decided I'll never be in the movies again. And I met two guys. One was Gene Quintano, the former executive of, of Xerox, and another one from West Virginia, believe it or not, Marshall Lupo, whose family was were restaurant people. And these guys kept pushing me that I lost all my money and I must have something from all that. And I said, well, all I have is my demo reel. And they said, well, we can raise the money. We got a lot of people in the D.C. area. They kept after me, and they said, let me see what you did there. You had to have something. So I said, all right, I'll set it up in New York. We got to go to New York, where they got a silver screen and a projection system. Well, I took, took them to New York. We went in this projection system, and they went nuts when they saw that stuff. Screaming and yelling, things hitting them in their face. They said, we can raise this money Let's do this picture. So I said, all right. I thought, said I wasn't going to do ever again, but you guys want to give it a shot. I lost my money twice, so maybe we'll lose it again. But we started raising money. Then I got to Ned Tannen. Ned Tannen was the head of production at Universal. So I called him, told him, I got something that's interesting I want to show you. When are you going to be in New York? He said, I'll be in New York in 10 days. So I go to New York and... I had Bukowski there with his primitive projection lens. And I put up the, that footage I did in Italy, and he fell out of the chair, ducking and laughing and carrying on. He said, how soon can you guys be in Hollywood? So we go to Hollywood, go into the room, and the whole damn studio's there. And the same thing happens. They start ducking and laughing and carrying on. Same reaction. We get done. Tannen walks out with us. He said, I knew I'd get that reaction. He says, you guys go back to New York and I'll get to you within a week. Tannen calls me. He says, I got bad news, Tony. Distribution is afraid to touch it. He said, everybody loved the presentation, but they said, there's no theaters. How are we going to distribute it? That's because no, no, no theaters had had silver screens, which was not a cheap thing in those days. So they passed. So there we were, left again. But we went and we raised the money and we made it. And our concept was correct. 25, 30, 40 lines of dialogue and just nonstop build up to effects. 
And this time I'm smart because I learned what was wrong with that camera. There's an optic called a wedge where you can straighten the direction of an image. If you, if you know anything about photography, if you use a 50 millimeter lens, it covers a certain distance. If you move that lens, just like you move your, your head with your glasses, the wedge optics in your glasses are directing the image through the glass so you see it without distortion. That was the basic thing we had to solve with that camera, which would give us the possibility to do slow motion, follow bullets, arrows, fix that stupid primitive uh, viewfinder so that the operator can follow focus. Well, there's a place in that picture, it's, it's hard to see it, because to understand it seeing it flat, but I run across an entire plaza towards the camera, they shoot an arrow behind me. When I get to the camera, it passes my head and goes into the audience. And we did that at one shot, which nobody had ever done in 3D. We finally built those, those, those optics in Madrid, and we had wedges that we would place in the lenses to do what we want to do. And that was the technology that I discovered and we rebuilt when I did the second picture, a 3D projection lenses that adjusted to every theater based on the size of the theater. And I made a fortune from that. So all that technical experience that I had from all that was failures and going broke and everything started finally to pay off. When, when we turned Hollywood on to all the money we made with coming at you in, in a very limited number of theaters, even when Universal made Jaws and all these other films and Paramount, Columbia, they all made movies in 3D. There still wasn't 100% 3D theaters. And that ultimately killed 3D again, you know, plus the kind of films they made. And I designed this projection lens with a, with a, an award-winning cinematographer from, that was from Poland. And he was working at Aer uh, Aeroflex in America. And I took him with me on Treasure of the Four Crowns because I used a different system. They improved the camera to mine and Baldi's requirements. And that's how I met uh, Stan Loth the cinematographer. And I told him about what we did, and he understood that about the, the optics that we were doing for magnifying and directing vision and images corresponding with your eyes, and that I understood about you see in dimension because it's a the brain. Your brain responds to the depth of field in the image that you look at, which is the whole key of what 3D is. After the, making all that money, selling projection lenses all over the world where people were putting in silver screens, I talked to Stan. I said, if, if we can do something like we're doing with depth of field and enlarging images without distortion, we can help the medical endoscopic world that goes into the smallest parts of the body. So we started with medical monitors that they use in the ORs, which are the highest quality at that time. And we experimented with optics that was placed in front of those medical monitors. And we were en enabling doctors to go into the smallest part of the body, including the tear duct underneath your eye. So we went into the manufacturing business. And pretty soon we started selling these, these optics after I got FDA approval, which was another war that I had to go through and had to learn how to do and open a facility in Long Island, buy optical machines for polishing, on and on and on. Now we're in the medical business and we're going into operating rooms to set up our lenses, which was called DAFI, depth of field imaging. We found out by going into to places that really had difficulty, spine, delicate plastic surgery. We even went into veterinarian places where they, where they work on, on the hoofs of thoroughbreds. We were testing all over the country. 
me and Howard Worth, who is a Hollywood producer, together with Stan Loth in the lab, we discovered that we could reconstruct endoscopes and together with the screen could give surgeons depth of field, enlarge the images without distortion and help them during complicated procedures. And the big breakthrough was we went to Cleveland Clinic after we got FDA approval on everything. And they went into the woman's breasts. They went into the nipple and down into the milk ducts, which is where they find the cancer. And Cleveland Clinic got very, very excited because they said this could eliminate these terrible biopsies where they have to go into the breasts and women have a lot of problems from that. So we started and we funded, found the money again, like always, like the movies, the money to set up research that led to going to medical shows. Then we were so successful, we went into Johns Hopkins, Cedars Sinai in Los Angeles, working on that upside down camera led to all these products and entering all these worlds, all difficult, difficult. It's too long of a story how long it took and the, me the misses and the ups and downs, but we did it. I, from meeting all these people, being all over the world, studying films like I did, you learn about people. So I always had in the back of my mind about doing an in memoriam book, people known and unknown, people known and now forgotten. So after I met Tom Stern, a, a Hollywood producer who convinced me to digitize coming at you, and while we were working on it, I was working with, with technicians in New York and in Hollywood. And that's when my cousin says to me, Gene, I used to go all over the country when I could to fish with him. And he was he was a wonderful guy. So he said to me, look, you're making these trips from the from the West Coast to New York. Why don't you come back to West Virginia? And while you're finishing this picture, we'll go fishing. So I came back here. And when I get here, he was sick and it was cancer. And I had the worst six months of my life helping him through that until he passed. And at the same time, I'd finished coming at you and, and Tom Stern and I made a deal for distribution. And now I'm sitting in West Virginia. I had all these files that I'd been doing research for years. And so I decided to do an encyclopedia book about history that happened in the month of January. I put out the encyclopedia book and the, the sales were soft. So I decided, well, I'm going to start with an in memoriam book. And everybody said, well, I don't know why you didn't do that with, from the beginning, because that's your world that you came from. So I did an in memoriam book. Well, in doing that book, I discovered the strength of quotes. If you could tie the people's story to their quotes. It gives you insight into that person. And right in the middle of that, we got hit with the pandemic. So I'm going crazy. What am I going to do? During this pandemic, I'm going to attack around the clock this quotes and thoughts book that might touch a nerve. An author is like Hemingway used to say, writing is a daily hell. And that is the truth. You never stop. I don't care what it is. Even if it's a poem, you never stop. It's hard to put to bed. But all at once, I'm getting five-star global reviews. And one of the most important thing I learned in this entertainment business was with Alan Klein. Listen to this. When Stranger in Town opened, this goes to show you how the media is. We were a sensation. Full page ads, signboard, I mean, television ads. I mean, I got all upset because I got a call. Tony, Time Magazine reviewed Stranger in Town. You may not like it, but it's fantastic that they have reviewed you. So I ran down to the to the drugstore and got Time Magazine. You know what they said? Stranger in town is like walking into a museum. 
and looking at a black wall. I called Alan, I told his secretary, tell him I got to see him immediately. And I rushed down there because, you know, I was in the hotel, the Warwick Hotel, barged into his office, threw it on his desk, and I said, you got to read that what Time Magazine said. He says, I don't have to read it. I had five calls about it. What's, what is, what's wrong with you? I said, they trashed us. We got the, one of the biggest hits in the country, and they trashed us. He said, sit down. He screamed at me. Alan was really strong. He says, Tony, think about it. Why did Time Magazine write about our little stranger in town? I said, I don't know. They wrote about it because they had to write about it, because it's headlines in the entertainment business. Now, you listen to me. And he, was, he knew about this. He says, it doesn't matter what they say about you. The important thing is they have to say something about you. And I never worried again after that. I, if I ever read a bad review, and I had a lot of bad reviews in my time, I just let it go like water off my back. I learned from that kind of stuff. Um, we'll move on. Um, I'm going to run the video now that uh, Jay Michaels has provided to us with... Um, uh, it's a, a series of um, performances by actors reading quotes from uh, Tony's new book. This is Jay Michaels. Mark Zuckerberg, founder of Facebook, said this about fake news. Mark Zuckerberg was suspected by Congress and others to sponsor fake news, especially for political stories which help create enormous advertising. But Zuckerberg in his defense, had always insisted that he runs a technology company, not a media company. Facebook is not the final arbiter of truth, he said. It should be an editor, not a censor, a guide, not a dictator. Studies have found that over 67% of Americans and over 44% of users got news from this site. That makes Facebook the most influential and powerful publisher in the world. And that came from Amy Bell at the Columbia Journalism Review. Mm -hmm. Okay, and now Donna White with news from Tinseltown. Betty Davis was an Academy Award winner who made over 100 films with a career spanning 60 years. She is regarded as one of the greatest actresses in Hollywood history. And when she spoke, Watch out. On the bad blood between herself and superstar jo Joan Crawford, she slept with every male star at MGM except Lassie. When Davis was asked why she was so good at playing bitches in so many films, why am I so good at playing bitches? I think it's because I'm not a bitch. Maybe that's why Joan Crawford always played ladies. On if she ever had good times when she worked with the difficult Joan Crawford. The best time I ever had with Joan Crawford was when I pushed her down the stairs in Whatever Happened to Baby Jane. And how did she feel about the death of Joan Crawford? You should never say bad things about the dead. You should always say good. Joan Crawford is dead. Good. <laughs> Holding court is great. And Joan Crawford did it very well, as did Betty Davis. Uh, but changing the world is also pretty great. Some inspirational words from Zara Zeitman. Susan B. Anthony's actions and organizational work led to the passage of the 13th Amendment abolishing slavery and the 19th Amendment granting women the right to vote. She started campaigning for the abolition of slavery and rights of women at the age of 16 and was the first woman to appear on a US coin when in 1979, a $1 coin was struck with her likeness. Susan B. Anthony shouted for all to be heard. Organize, agitate and educate must be our war cry. No man is good enough to govern any woman without her consent. Saint Mother Teresa, one of the 20th century's greatest humanitarians on love, caring and joy. St. Mother Teresa spent her entire life fighting for and helping the impoverished, lonely, 
sick and unfortunate people of all ages in Calcutta. On her spirit of the soul words about love and helping others. Do you think that love in order to be genuine has to be extraordinary? What we need is to love without being tired. She also said, we ourselves feel that what we are doing is just a drop in the ocean. But if that drop were not there, I think the ocean would be less by missing that drop. And now Lynn Henderson, who is living the dream. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., civil rights leader and Nobel Prize winner on his mission. Martin Luther King Jr.'s mission was for harmony, serenity, and freedom for all. And he led the fight against discrimination based on the belief that some races by nature or the color of their skin are superior to others. His words on peace, true peace is not merely the absence of tension. It is the presence of justice. Words on his response when he was accused of disturbing the peace during the Montgomery bus boycott in 1999 in Alabama. Returning hate for hate multiplies hate, adding deeper darkness to a night already devoid of stars. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. From King's 1947 sermon held in Montgomery, Alabama, on trying to forgive your enemies. Shallow understanding from people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. And Dr. King spoke these famous words from the steps of the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. on August 23rd, August 28th, 1963. I have a dream that one day the state of Alabama, whose governor's lips are presently dripping with the words of interposition and nullification, will be transformed into a situation where little black boys and little black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and little white girls and walk together as sisters and brothers. We have a fascination with the movies uh, and we think all movies are wonderful, but you can't please everybody. Tell us all about it, Tara Vega. Robert Pattinson hated playing Edward Cully in the Twilight film franchise. Perhaps his best quote, he's the most ridiculous person. The more I read the script, the more I hated this guy. Plus, He's a 108-year-old virgin, so he's obviously got some issues there. Arnold Schwarzenegger hated playing the role of Kalidor in Red Sonja. Schwarzenegger starred in Red Sonja, a 1985 film revealing, it's the worst film I have ever made. When my kids get out of line, they're sent to their rooms and forced to watch Red Sonja 10 times. I never had too much trouble with them. On when he was making Casablanca in 1942, the iconic actor-director Orson Welles asked him how it was going. Bogart complained, it was the worst movie I'd been in. <laughs> I wonder what Bogey would have thought when the American Film Institute voted Casablanca number one on the list of top US love stories and number 32 for the other list of most inspiring movies of all time. As the cancer got bad, Bogey had a rough time and hung on for another 10 months, finally passing at age 57 with Bacall at his side. His attributed last words, I should never have switched from scotch to martinis. And speaking of martinis, let's chat with Doug DeVita about marriage. Cher, singer, actress, television personality, and diva on how to keep a husband. Husbands are like fires. 
They go out when left unattended. Oscar Wilde, world-famous Irish poet and playwright in the 1800s on how he felt about love and marriage. One should always be in love. That is the reason one should never marry. Rodney Dangerfield, known for his self-deprecating one-liners on his successful marriage. I tell you, my wife, we get along good because we have our own arrangement. I mean, one night a week, I go out with the boys, and one night a week, she goes out with the boys. Margaret Cho, critiquing social and political, start over. Margaret Cho, critiquing social and political problems regarding race and sexuality on marriage and tattoos. I look at husbands the same way I look at tattoos. I mean, I want one, but I can't decide what I want. And I don't want to be stuck with one. I'm just going to have, uh, sorry, start over again. I look at husbands the same way I look at tattoos. I want one, but I can't decide what I want. And I don't want to be stuck with one. I'm just going to grow to hate and have to have surgically removed later. Jackie Mason ranked number 63 on Comedy Central's 100 Greatest Stand-Up Comedians on Married Men and America. 80% of married men cheat in America, the rest in Europe. Tim Moss is a stand-up guy. He's also excellent at stand-up. Phyllis Diller, outrageous, eccentric stage and film persona on how to have a happy, long marriage. Never go to bed mad. Stay up and fight. <laughs> the wild, iconic comedian for decades spoke on house cleaning. Housework won't kill you, but then again, why take the chance? <laughs> Joan Rivers, as she became older, did she still love Valentine's Day? Oh, don't talk to me about Valentine's Day. At my age, an affair of the heart is a bypass. Oh, I'm telling you, seriously. Wanda Sykes, actress and comedian named by Entertainment Weekly as one of the 25 funniest people in America. And what she had to say on winning the lottery, I am gonna tell you right now. Somebody walked in here and told me I just won the lottery. I will walk out in the middle of this joke. Ellen DeGeneres, comedian, actress, writer, producer, and host of her hit TV talk show on what it's like to be a godmother. I'm a godmother. That's a great thing to be, a godmother. She calls me God for short. Yeah, that's cute. I taught her that. Now, remember the Hollywood scare squares? Remember laughing? Well, Nanette Deasy and Sam Katz from the Improvisational Repertory Theater Ensemble will give us their own laugh in. Jonathan Winters on his job requiring so much air travel. If God had really intended man to fly, he'd make it easier to get to the airport. <laughs> <laughs> Lenny Bruce, known for his freestyle critical form of comedy on growing up. When you're eight years old, nothing is any of your business. <laughs> <laughs> Amy Schumer, stand-up comedian and actress about being cautious dating. I went on a date with this French guy cause he was off. He said something adorable like, I have an apartment. <laughs> <laughs> Dean Martin, one of the most popular and enduring entertainers of the mid 20th century and nicknamed the King of Cool. On drinking, I was so drunk last night I fell down and missed the floor. <laughs> <laughs> well, David Brenner, who is a stand up comedian and the most frequent guest on The Tonight Show, starring Johnny Carson in the 70s and 80s on Family Ancestors. Misers aren't fun to live with, but they make wonderful ancestors. 
Bill Maher, comedian and talk show host of the political real time, uh, said this about religion. You know, to most Christians, the Bible is just like a software license. They just scroll to the bottom and click, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> well, Woody Allen, director, comedian, actor, uh, writer, I mean, with a career spanning more than six decades, mm -hmm. said this about being nobody. Uh, eternal nothingness is fine if you're actually dressed for. Or he said something like that, but you know, he was funny. <laughs> well, Us. Jay, Jay Leno, after doing stand up for years, became host of the Tonight Show. Tonight Show from 1992 to 2009 on worrying about the U.S. government. How many are worried about a government shutdown? <laughs> How many are worried about it starting back up? <laughs> Delayed spit take. Jerry, oh, Jerry Seinfeld on uh, uh, contemplating our misunderstanding of death said um, proof that we don't understand death is that we give dead people a pillow. <laughs> Never thought of that before. Now one more. I got one more. George Carlin called the dean of counterculture comedians on the meaning of life. Just when I discovered the meaning of life, they changed it. <laughs> and and Henny Youngman, the king of one-liners on how he felt about marriage. Everybody, one, two, three, take, take my, my wife, my wife please. please. As Tony mentioned, much of a stranger in town uh, subverts genre expectations by design. Did that also extend to the ratio? Technoscope was the standard for spaghetti westerns, but the first three strangers were in standard ratio. Was that Luigi Vanzi's way of saying this movie is no epic? Uh, it's as small and insignificant as our hero? Interesting question. Well, when we did Stranger in Town, we didn't have the money to do it in widescreen. In fact, it was so bad, we had to look at the rushes in black and white because we didn't have the money because it was part of the money I was supposed to be bringing into the production. So we looked at the film always in black and white. And that's the way I showed it to Alan Klein, if you can believe that. It was all about money. In fact, I started to like the picture in black and white, but that's the, that's the real th reason. Money. Okay. Um, the next question, SIU um, is asking. I finally saw come together last month. The LP was in England, but not the film. Did you intend it to be a comment on the end of the '60s? Not really. It just turned out to be that way. And the film really did the biggest business in the US. But we did break out in other foreign countries. But I don't think we played in London. But the LP was there because the LP went out everywhere. Okay. Um... Marianne wrote, uh, this isn't a question, this is a comment. Hello, Tony, I can relate to the journey of education to learn acting for theater and carving your own way for funding. Um, Actually, I have a question about um, uh, Dan Vadis. We, uh, we, we, never right. talked about, <laughs> we never talked about Dan Vadis during our interview. Uh, your co-star in The Stranger Returns, he had done some Hercules movies before uh, 
before doing, uh, and then went on to do some Clint Eastwood movies after uh, The Stranger Returns. Yeah, Dan Vadis is a very, is, could be an interesting story. The, the part was originally cast uh, for the German actor. I can't even remember his name, his past. Uh, Klaus Kinski? <laughs> Klaus Kinski. Oh. Klaus was very difficult. He'd done a number of Westerns. So when he gets to Rome, he decides that he's going to pick his horse. And naturally, he goes out to the corrals and picks the, the, the strongest, most contrary horse of all the bunch. And the stunt man says, it's better that you don't use that horse because he's dangerous. And, and, and Kinski told him, he says, look, I know more about horses than you do, and I'll pick the horse that I'm going to be on. So the stunt man told me, and I said, well, I'll talk to him. And he took off on me like, like, I, was an in the, like I was an invalid. Don't you talk to me about horses. I know more about horses than all these people do here. So Bonsi says, let's see you. We're gonna do, we're gonna do the opening of the film as you leading 20 of your bandits into the town. So Kinski gets up on that, that monster and he comes roaring down Main Street and slides that horse to, to stop in front of the saloon and jerks on him to rear him up and turn him around and that horse flipped over and came down on the steps of the saloon and broke his back. Again, Tony Anthony's in trouble. Got to shut down. Got to replace Kinski. He'll be in the hospital for a month and have to, you know, with a back injury, breaking your back. Well, we had a, a deal with Germany, a co-production. And they said, if we replace Kinski with Dan Vadis, who before was a big star in the, in the Italian Hercules movies, and whether we liked it or not, was the only way that we could continue with making the film. So we hired Dan Vadis. And that's, that's, that's how it happened. I'm glad you remembered Klaus Kinski. There I am about remembering names. Um, okay, I'm just looking through the questions here again. Oh yes, why was The Silent Stranger held from release for five years? Well, that's actually something that we, we talked to Tony about and I ended up um, cutting it for time. Um, I don't know, Tony, if you wanna get a lot To make a long story short, by the time I got back from Japan, Bob O'Brien was under the gun to be replaced, you know, in one of those Hollywood takeovers of studios. And Alan Klein was a Bob O'Brien uh, booster and defender, especially from his stock position. He and uh, Carlo Ponti, Sophia Lauren's husband, who was a big producer who did Dr. Zhivago. So the studio was taken over, Bob O'Brien was gone, and Alan Klein, who fought the, the guys coming in, was shut out of the studio. So the Stranger movie went on the shelf, and that's why it didn't come out right after, you know, when it did. And Klein sold all his stock and you know, left MGM because he was involved with them in their music part, their, their music division with and very heavily involved there. And then finally with another regime, they decided to put out the picture. That's why it was so long between, you know, the two, the other two films. 
Hollywood. You never count on anything. You make a friend today and they're gone tomorrow. That's the way it is. Okay, I'm gonna take a few more questions here. Um, this one's interesting. Were you deliberately satirizing the dollar films in your first two stranger films, especially the Colonel Mortimer character in the second? No, uh, we tried to stay completely away from that. But, but no matter what you did in those days of those 700 films and, that were made in that era, everybody was accused of imitating Leone and, and, the, and the dollar pictures. But we tried to avoid it, but we fell into that. And I don't know why, but the press, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm skipping ahead here. Uh, after 1983, did you ever want to be an actor again? Well, I told you about when I decided I, was, I didn't want to be an actor again, but to, that after the, I made Treasure of the Four Crowns, I just I just got tired of it. I tired tired of the the, the wars, you know. And I decided, you know, that I would just produce keep keep myself involved and do other things because i was always doing other things as i as i've explained okay um, and that's that's really how i just stopped everybody thought i was crazy you know but i did uh tim asks were any of you <laughs> shot without sound or were they all sync sound sync sound but just to, just in order to be able to go in the studio and dub them. And sync sound that would have been unusual for Italian parents, right? At that time, all the films in Italy were like that. They would shoot what they call a guide track live, but not with perfect sound. Then you would go into the studio and they would put up the pieces of film and you would have your earphones on and you would re re-perform the whole picture. Then all the films are made like that. Like when I made uh, uh, Engagement Italiano, the first Italian film, the Italian was screaming in Italian. Annie Giardot speaking to me in French and the assistant director screaming to me in, in English. And I'm speaking in English. And later they put all the, the, the soundtrack together in Italian, including me. That's how I learned to concentrate with all those crazy films I made, with all the madness around me, to block it out, you know, concentration. Carnegie. Um. Do you want to ask, uh, Paul has a question about songwriting. Uh, if you wrote the missionary song in, I think no. it's in Stranger in Town, no? No, not. My, my music career was over, even though I did a lot of, I, you know, I helped set up the concert for Bangladesh with, for, uh, you know, George Harrison's greatest, you know, I, I think one of the top concert films of all time. But I was always around that that world because of Klein. But never again singing or writing or any of that stuff. I got my fill of that. Um, uh, Tom Betts is wondering uh, about Frank Wolf, about uh, what it was like working with Frank Wolf. Poor Frank. I met Frank in New York. We were both being interviewed by Eli, Ilya Kazan for America, America. And uh, we became good friends because we were called back. I was, both of us called back three times. Well, I didn't get the part because he decided, Kazan decided that he was gonna go with a, a, a Greek kid. But Frank got the part, went on to Italy after that film and 
he became a star in Italy. But Frank's a very interesting story because he turned Sergio Leone down for a fistful of dollars, saying nobody's going to go see a, an Italian Western. But then after the, the explosion of, of Westerns, Tom, I mean, uh, Frank started working in all kinds of Westerns. And we, I had, I called him, even though we had no money, and he did me a favor. And he was the reason that picture worked because he was terrific. You know, he was really the bad guy. Well, he just was a good technician. And the part of that success was because of him. And then when I did Blind Man, he was on a downside. And he came to see me and he said he wanted to, wanted to be in Blind Man. And it was too late because the film was cast and I was getting ready to start it. In fact, Lloyd Batista was, was doing the role that he wanted to do. And I couldn't, I couldn't give him the job. And he reminded me that he did me the favor with Stranger in Town. And he really needed to do this picture because he believed it would go out all over the world. And it was a good part. And I said, I said, Frank, I said, I would do anything for you. And I promise you, the next thing I do, you will be a part of it. But I can't do anything now because we're, we're getting ready to shoot. And I tell you, it was probably maybe a couple of months after that. I'm living in this apartment complex that's right next to the Hilton Hotel, and he lived there. And I, he knocked on my door and said that Frank Wolf had just killed himself. And Frank slit his own throat, supposedly over a, a woman. And I felt bad about that the rest, well, I felt about it, bad about that for the rest of my life. So he really probably needed that job at that time. And I didn't really understand how bad he needed it. I wish I could tell you a nicer story about Frank, but that, that's, that's the actual thing that happened to me. Um, uh, Antonio is asking if you ever dub your voice to Italian in any of your films. Say that again, what? If you've ever dubbed your voice in Italian in any of your films. I never could learn to speak Italian good. In fact, I used to mix Italian with Spanish when I worked in Spain or wherever I worked. No, I never, <laughs> to this Today I still can't speak Italian, but I understand a lot about it. You know, Tony, thank you so much. And I hope that uh, you have enjoyed the celebration of your career as, you know, as, as much as uh, we have enjoyed it. Uh, it's been a pleasure working with you. And I'm so happy that, um, you know, that you got in touch with us and that we were, we were able to, uh, to work with you and to put this program together um, speaking for myself, it's been a blast. I just want to say this. Jay Michaels called me about working with you guys. And I respect Jay. I mean, he's fantastic. And he's somebody that's going to be so big in this industry. I mean, he's, he's impeccable. And I felt confidence talking to you and working with your brother, Chris. You guys did a hell of a job. In fact, I avoided doing publicity all my career because I did a lot of stupid things with my ego and not caring. But you guys put me at, 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 at ease, got me to speak about so many things. I think it's, it's terrific what you guys did and stay at it. Thank you. Jay, I love you, buddy. <laughs> okay, well, um, 
I think it's time to, to say goodnight. So thanks again and everybody um, enjoy the rest of the weekend.